Another time, Jesus went into the synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with the shriveled hand, Stand up in front of everyone. Then Jesus asked them, Which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save a life or to kill? But they remained silent. He looked around at them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts, said to the man, Stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was completely restored. And God added his blessing. Oh, wait, this is actually important. It's part of the sermon. It's the sixth verse. <laughs> then the Pharisees went out and they began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. You know, see, it's actually a point, an important point. My instinct, and I think the instinct of a lot of us today, is let's wrap up the story with a happy ending. And that was the happy ending, right? The happy ending, the man's healed. But that's not always the way it is in life, right? Even after a happy ending, some difficult things can happen. We'll talk about that today, because I do want to talk about miracles. Uh, if you ever want to feel, uh, if you're ever feeling discouraged, if you're ever feeling like uh, you wonder if God breaks into the lives of people and has an effect on them in a miraculous way, let me suggest a couple of things you can do. You can go Google miracles, do that, and you will see thousands and thousands of pages there, people describing their miracles. Uh, that I found by doing that, that there's a Facebook page uh, called 100,000 Miracles. And it's a place where people can just post the miracles that they've experienced in their lives. That's always wonderful, right? very inspirational. I found a lot of inspiring stories uh, there when I, when I did that and looked on the internet. But if the internet's not your thing, you can go to the uh, New York Times bestseller list, look under nonfiction, and you're going to see a few, at least a uh, few books there about the miracles that people have experienced in their lives or in the lives of their families. Uh, we know miracles are important. In fact, we Christians especially know that miracles are important because the, the very foundation of our faith has to do with the, the greatest miracle of all. And that is in the face of our own brokenness, in the face of our own disobedience, in the face of our own self-centeredness, God healed us by sending his son, Jesus Christ. His birth, his life, his death, his resurrection, all one incredible miracle that makes it possible for us not just to be followers of Christ, not just to be disciples of Christ, which we are, but to also be brothers and sisters in Christ, to be children of God. You see, uh, the basics of our faith, the very core of the reason why we're here, is this wonderful miracle. And we know we need it. And that's why we, uh, we uh, grab onto this faith. That's why we give thanks for all that God has given us. But we know even in the face of that great miracle, there are a lot of other miracles we need in our lives as well. Lots of miracles, miracles of healing, and not just body, which is certainly uh, the case in everybody's life at one time or another. Uh, we, we need some uh, healing of our bodies, but also healing of our minds, healing of our spirits, uh, healing of our fear, uh, of the, getting the miracle of courage in our life to overcome something, to have the miracle of change come into our lives. What a great miracle change can be, because year after year, decade after decade, we do the same thing, but we know and believe that with God's help, we can get to the point where we act better, we act differently, we act more as God would want us to act, a miracle of transformation. We are seeking all of these kind of miracles in our lives. So where do we find them? And that's what I want to focus on today. Where do we find the miracles that God has for us? And I want to look at this story of uh, Jesus and the man with the withered hand to give us some clues. Because we know the who of the miracles. God provides the miracles in our lives. We know what the miracles are. They're, they're great transformations in, in health, in, in, in our spirits, uh, in our actions. Uh, but where do we find them? Where can they be found? Because they seem elusive sometimes. Sometimes we start imagining that miracles are something that just happened a long time ago. Miracles are just something that happened to other people. So let's take a look at this story. The where of the miracle. Now, right off, we have some, some good material here because the where of the miracle is church. That's where this particular miracle occurs. It occurs 
in church. And boy, that is my prayer. That is my hope that the church is a place where miracles happen. It certainly seems that way from what we learn in the Bible. Over and over again, we're told of this incredible power that comes when we gather together. When we come together as one people, great things happen. In Matthew, Jesus wrote that, or said that, where two or three are gathered, I will be there also. And in the book of James, it says, if you are sick, Call the elders. Have them come together and to pray for you. There's a power in coming together in prayer and in worship and in fellowship as, as well. It's, it's a wonderful time. And I'll tell you, there is a power, again, to coming together. We see it in the Bible and we see it in, in other miracles. One of my favorite miracles, I loved it ever since I was a little kid, was this miracle of the, the people bringing their friend on a stretcher to Jesus and there's so many people surrounding the house that Jesus is in that they can't get in. And so they put, they get the fellow up on the roof and they tear a hole in the roof and they lower him down to Jesus. And when they do that, Jesus says something amazing. He says, the faith of your friends has made you well. The power of the people we surround ourselves with. Yes, and here, and then also in other places. I mean, there are people we surround ourselves with at work. We don't necessarily have the choice of who those people, uh, people are. But then there are lots of other people in our lives we do choose. Now, are we choosing the kind of people to surround ourselves with that lift us up? Or are we choosing the kind of people that pull us down? Well, that's important. Such an important fact. There's a number. Let me see. Oh, yeah, it's called, it's a sociological concept called the Dunbar number. The Dunbar number. The Dunbar number is the number of stable relationships that the average person can maintain in their lives. Oh, we accept this. I know hundreds and hundreds of people, but how many stable relationships can I maintain? Can I keep going by checking in with people, by socializing uh, with them, by keeping up with what's going on in their lives? And this fellow Dunbar said, for the average person, well, let's guess, we've got a good group here. How many people do you think? Good, stable relationships, how many can you have in your life, or the average person have? Five? Okay, you have a low number for Andy. He's going in low. <laughs> what else? How many? That's a little bad guess. How many stable relationships? Hmm? How many, Dora? Five? You're going with five, too? Five's a, five's a popular number. Um, actually, it's 150. Sorry. <laughs> now, now, these aren't your best friends. They're not the people in your family. They, of course, count in that group. But it's all the people that you can stay in touch with and contact with. And so, well, it's, and for you, it may be 150. Or for you, it may be 250. Or for you, it may be five. Whatever your number is, who's in that circle right there? Who's in that number? Are they the kind of people that lift you up, that help you find miracles in your life? Or are they the kind of people that, that can pull you down? It's something important for us to think about, especially for those of us who are looking for miracles uh, in our lives. It's, it's who we surround ourselves with can be very, very important. Well, um, the one thing we've got to see, and we notice too, when we go outside of this story, is we see that though this miracle did happen in church, and that's a wonderful thing, and I love bringing that up, most of Jesus' had miracles happened outside of the church. So where do miracles occur? Yes, they can occur here in the church, but more specifically, when we look at the whole ministry of Jesus Christ, they happen where the need existed. Wherever the need existed, that's where Jesus performed a miracle. So yes, he saw the need when he was in church. He went into church, the scriptures say, and he saw a man with a withered hand. He went into Peter's house, and he saw that Peter's mother-in-law was sick. And that's where that miracle happened, right at the moment of need. He was walking through the streets of Jericho, and he saw a blind man. And when he encountered that need, that's where that miracle happened. He was in Jerusalem at the uh, pool of uh, Bethsaida. And there he saw a man infirmed, and that's where that miracle happened. Miracles often happen for Jesus, right where the need exists. One thing I like to do is to look at uh, 
uh, productivity uh, gurus, these people that try to help you be, you know, get more done in your life. And there was a guy who wrote a book called Getting Things Done. And he told that his, one piece of his advice is to get everything you need to do, write on a piece of paper, and get this whole stack of papers, and then go through them one by one. And he's got this whole flow chart for where everything should go. But one of the rules on the flow chart is if one of those things in your list as you're going through it takes less than 60 seconds, you do it right then. Do it right at that moment. In fact, uh, ideally, you don't even write it down. You just think of it, you do it, it's gonna take less than 60 seconds. And so right away, you're cutting it within an hour or two, you're cutting your list in half, or almost down, maybe even down to nothing, just by getting these little annoying tasks out of the way. Doing it quickly, getting it done, getting it out of your mind and off that list, and, and crossing it off. Well, that's exactly what Jesus did, except he did it with all his miracles. He would encounter a need, and that's where the miracle would occur. So here's the challenge for us today. Here's the challenge. We have to be willing to identify the areas of need in our lives. The areas where transformation is needed. This is, a, uh, this is tough. And it can be scary. Turning that magnifying glass inward, turning it in toward us. Try to see that in those areas where we're not living up to being all that God wants us to be and then committing to that. And being willing to seek out the miracles of transformation that God has in store for us. We simply cannot get to any of these miracles unless we're first willing to identify the need for them. So there's an important first step. And the finding of miracles is being able, willing to see where the need exists. If we want to find miracles in our lives, there's a good first step. But here's another step, very important, because it's true of every miracle in the New Testament. Every one of Jesus' miracles, there's something, there's an obstacle that has to be overcome. Every miracle, there is an obstacle that has to be overcome. Overcome. And here, of course, in this story, it's the Pharisees. The Pharisees are not happy with Jesus. They don't like him. And, and they're looking for a way to entrap him. And so they are the obstacle keeping that man from the healing that he wants. There they are, all glowering at Jesus. Everybody knows what's going on. Everybody knows that they don't like Jesus. Everybody knows that they think Jesus is, is, is bad and it, it should be punished. And here Jesus is telling this man, stand up, come over here, come on, come over to me. And he's going to have the courage to do that work, to overcome that obstacle of those glaring Pharisees. Well, how many times in our lives is there some miracle out there just waiting, God waiting to do this miracle for us, but we're not willing to do the work to overcome the obstacle? It's probably one of the biggest misconceptions about miracles. Here's the belief, we look. At night we pray and say, God, I'm asking for this miracle in my life, and now I'm just going to sit back, and it's either going to happen or it's not going to happen. Well, that's not the way miracles work in the life of Jesus. People have to work, have to overcome obstacles to get to Jesus, to get to that point where they can connect with him, when they can interact with him. The, uh, uh, the miracle of the woman who was sick. She was sick for years and years and years. And she was, again, it was the crowd that was the obstacle. The crowd was what she had to get through. And, and she's the one who touched the hem of Jesus' garment. You wonder, well, why'd she do that? The hem of his garment was right down here. Why is she touching that? Well, I always picture her as crawling through the crowd, willing to get down and to do the work of moving and pushing through the crowd, of being stepped on, just so she can get close enough to stretch out that hand and to touch the hem of his garment. That's the obstacle she had to overcome. And if we want to find miracles in our lives, there are obstacles we have to overcome too. And sometimes it's, uh, sometimes it's the people around us. Sometimes even our best champions and those who love us the most aren't going to want some particular miracle for us because it's going to mean change in their lives. And we can't blame them for that. that. It's hard to endure change, but sometimes it is those who are closest to us. Let me give you an example. Myself, I have two teenagers at home, Leslie and I do. And boy, it's a little miracles are happening all the time as these teenagers uh, spread their wings. 
as they do different things, as they challenge themselves, as they, as they grow in their independence, and sometimes they are doing things, exercising their independence with my absolute blessing, and other times it is to my absolute horrification what they're doing to spread their wings. But I'll tell you, no matter what it is, positive or, or things that, that can, be, can be hard for dad, I don't, it's so hard for me to see them as those teenagers and celebrate the fact they're spreading their wings. I look at them and I see two little kids in their footy pajamas having a tea party in our living room. And it's easy for me as a parent to try to hold back on some of these miracles of growing and expanding and, uh, and uh, embracing new independence that they're facing today. It's easy for me to be negative about that when much of the time I should be positive about it. We have to be careful that we're not the ones holding other people back. That that's, we're not the obstacle to somebody else's miracle. We sure have to be sure we don't allow others to do that to us. Don't allow others to be the obstacle that's keeping you from the miracle of transformation that God has in store for you. Now, sometimes it's people that can hold us back. And sometimes it's just the hard work. It's like the woman crawling through the crowd to get to Jesus. Uh, that's hard work. And sometimes we go, oh, I don't want to do it. I don't want to do the hard work that's going to get me over the obstacle to get to the place where God's going to provide me with a miracle. I just, it's just too much to do. It's too hard. I like that story of uh, Sylvester Stallone from his early career. Uh, this was back when he made a movie or two and he was living in Hollywood, but he wasn't making a living yet as an actor. And in fact, he had gotten to the point where he had, uh, he had such little money, he was so poor, that he could no longer afford to feed his dog. And so he sold his dog to a man that he met outside of a liquor store for $25. And he said that when he went home, he cried the whole way home having to had to sell his dog. And soon after that, he was uh, at home and he was watching sports on TV and a Muhammad Ali fight came on and suddenly he had an idea for a screenplay. The idea for a story about a down and out fighter who gets a shot at fighting the champ. And so he got busy. He started writing that screenplay himself. Soon he finished it, he began shopping it around Hollywood. And right away, the studios were interested. And they, they offered him $100,000. He said, here, we'll give you $100,000 for that script. And he said, uh, OK, but I want to star in it. And I said, oh, no way. You look funny, and you kind of talk funny. Uh, you're not going to star in this movie. We'll buy it from you, but we're going to get somebody else uh, to star in it. And he said, no, I'm not going to sell it. And they said, oh, we'll offer you $250,000. He said, nope. OK, well, I'll give you 350000 He said, only if I can star in it. So finally, the studio gave in. And they said, OK, you can star in it, but we're only going to pay you $35,000 for the script. And he did it. And of course, the movie was rocky. And it went on to win the best, uh, best picture in the Academy Awards, the best director, the best editing. So that's just the one was nominated for an Academy Award. Um, and, and it's become uh, one of the classic movies uh, of American cinema. Uh, but he had to do so much work. He had to overcome so many obstacles to get from that moment when he had nothing to that moment when he had that miracle of creativity that brought him this story that resounded with so many people around the world. And oh, by the way, um, once he got that $35,000, he went back to the liquor store where he sold his dog, and he stood there for three days waiting for that guy he sold his dog to uh, to come back, and he bought his dog back. The guy charged him $15,000 for his dog. Sold it for $25, bought it back for $15,000. So, uh, but, uh, but that's just one example. Man, there, there are all sorts of obstacles that can be between us and where God wants us to be so that he can perform a miracle for us. And we have to get busy. We have to get to work. We can't let those obstacles, even if they're the people in our lives, keep us from where we believe God wants us to be. God needs us to be. This moment, this place where these great miracles of transformation can take place. So yes, we need to identify the need. And we need to be willing to overcome the obstacles that are put in front of us, and no matter what they may be. 
But one thing we also need to recognize is that when we get there, so we found it, we found it. It's on the other side of an obstacle. It's right next to a need that I have in my life for transformation. That's where the miracle is. But once I get there and once I experience that miracle, know this, not everything will be perfect. When miracles happen in your life, it causes change. And a lot of times that means that new challenges come. Just because you've experienced some miracle in your life doesn't mean that everything is going to be better. New challenges may be on the way. Uh, a lot of us who are Harry Potter fans were really interested to hear that a new play is out now in London that takes it. And a lot of people have been disappointed by the fact that they're not happy. They're having difficulty in their lives. You see this miracle that occurred through the course of the first seven books. It's wrapped up so neatly at the end in a wonderful, happy ending. That miracle with Harry Potter being the chosen one and defeating evil, that had some negative consequences too. Yes, it was a miracle and it was to be celebrated, but some negative challenges come along for this family because of it. It's something we need to remember. There are all sorts of miracles of transformation that then lead to difficulties. Uh, many people have found it when they give up drinking. Now they have a drinking problem, they get into recovery, and they give up drinking, and it's wonderful, and it's a miracle, and they recognize that it's a miracle, but it brings on a whole new set of challenges as old friends now drop away. And where are the new friends? And now there's all that work to find new friends in life to take their place. It's a miracle. Yes, it's great. There's happiness, but there's sadness as well. The uh, grandma who's had Thanksgiving dinner at her house for 40 years, is now ready to retire. She doesn't want to have Thanksgiving dinner anymore. And so last week, here in August, she told her family, she said, listen, we're going to have family dinner at one of your houses, and I'm going to watch football at your house while you prepare dinner, okay? Just like I've been doing it for the last 40 years. And believe me, that is a miracle. To be able to break a pattern like that is a miracle. But it also comes with consequences. It comes with hurt feelings, and it comes with grieving, knowing we're never going to have dinner like we used to back in the old days. And then people have to grieve that. Let me tell you, yeah, miracles, you be prepared for this. You're praying for a miracle in your life. Be prepared for all of the consequences that come with it. But it can be very sacred, this combination uh, of joys that come with a miracle fulfilled and with new challenges that can come because of it as well. Just last week, I read an article in the New York Times about a fellow uh, whose name was uh, Michael. And, and 10 years ago, Michael was walking home from work, and, uh, and he was mugged by a 16-year-old, and he was shot in the head. And they rushed him to the hospital, but the family was told that he was brain dead 10 years ago. Uh, the family decided that they would uh, donate his organs to those in need. And so through that, uh, one decision, that one miracle of giving, lots of miracles happened, countless, as, as his organs were distributed to those in need. And one particular person uh, was at death's door. His name was Arthur. And, and they believed he had one week to live. He was at the top of the transplant list when, when this opportunity came, when he received Michael's heart. And now it's 10 years later, and he's in wonderful health. It's just been as good a recovery as possible uh, from a transplant. And he has stayed in touch with Michael's family. And they've stayed in touch with him. And they send cards back and forth, including uh, Michael's daughter, Jenny. Now, last October, uh, Jenny was engaged to be married. And she was thinking about what she should do as far as being given away to her father. Having been killed, she wasn't sure uh, what she should do. She thought of family members, and then she thought of Arthur. And she called him and said, would you be willing to give me away at my wedding? That way, part of my father will be with me. He agreed. In fact, he was honored. He said, I'll be there even if I have to walk from Philadelphia. So they stood in the back of the church, ready to process down the aisle, Arthur and Jenny. And Jenny took Arthur's arm, and he moved her hand to his wrist so that she could feel her father's heartbeat as she walked down the aisle. They got down to the front. And 
And there's Arthur and Jenny. She put her hand on his heart before he sat down. Sorrow and joy, miracles and grieving all mixed together. We should be ready for it when miracles happen. It can be sad too as change comes our way and in times of grieving on the other side, times of loss. We need to be made ready for these miracles that can come our way when we least expect it. We're all looking for miracles in our lives. Well, friends, if you open your eyes to the needs that exist in your heart, in your family, in your work, in your community, those around you, if you're willing to do the work to overcome the obstacles that stand between you and the point where God wants to grant you this miracle, and if you are prepared for what will come from this miracle, all of the consequences, then you won't have any trouble finding the miracles that God has in store for you in your life, and you will be amazed. You will be amazed at what those miracles will do for you. Let us bow in prayer. Loving God, we do give thanks for all the miracles in life. Loving God, help us to always be someone that moves toward miracles, that does the work necessary, that opens our eyes to the needs that exist, and also that enables all those around us to be miracles in themselves, to find those moments where you can work wonders in their lives. Loving God, help us to see this, help us to remember it as we go forward into this week ahead. And dear Lord, we do ask that you bless us as we prepare to come to this table. Lord, this is the moment in our worship service where we remember the great miracle of Christ's life, his birth, his death, and his resurrection. Loving God, help us to be touched by this wonderful miracle and help us to once again be transformed by it as we come together now to receive this bread and cup. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.